Okay, listen, I was expecting to have a lot of lore drop right into my lap when 3.0 dropped, but I was not prepared for this amount. Between both Archon quests, Tignari Story Quest, and the whole r and &R World Quest series, there is a lot to sift through. Originally, I was just going to recap everything since all these quests were really dense and long, but in the end, I realized that chronologically summarizing these events would just make things even more confusing because I'd have to explain everything out of order. So instead, I would like to spend this whole video focused on the big and important things that we learned from the Archon and Arnara quests instead. So while I'm not going to recap the events of these quest lines, I am going to be spoiling a lot of it. So if you haven't completed the quests that I'm listing on screen right now, then please proceed with caution. This is your final spoiler warning, okay? If you watch past this point, I'm just gonna assume that you've either done these quests or that you're just fine with spoilers. Okay, here we go. Let's start off with the Earmensal tree, because without this tree for context, a lot of the other lore bits don't make any sense at all. So the Earmensal is this thing. Yes, it's a giant pink tree, but functionally, it's more like a combination of a human heart and a human brain that's kind of been mushed together into one magical doohickey of a world organ that powers the entire globe. That was confusing, I'm sorry. It's basically the heart of the world, okay? And everything else is a vascular system. Now, I call it a brain because the tree stores all of the memory data for everything that ever existed within Tevat, and it's like a heart because it uses its roots like a vascular system to circulate memories and elemental energy throughout the entire world. When anything dies in Tevat, it returns to the roots of the Irmansul, which we call the ley lines, where they are stored and circulated for further use. However, because this memory data is stored and not destroyed, damaging the ley lines can allow for memories and elemental energy to leak out. Leaked memories can manifest into ghostly apparitions that appear to be sentient, and leaked elemental energy can cause environmental phenomena known as ley line disorders. The fog on Surumi Island, for example, is considered a ley line disorder. With that context of the Irmansul basically being the embodiment of Tevat's circle of life, the first part of the Archon quest should start to make a little bit more sense. The Irmansul, containing all the memories of the world, is part of an enormous repository of accumulated knowledge, which is why so many academia students try to connect it directly to it using the spirit borneal incense that we see in the very beginning of the Archon Quest. The Traveler, being the little lucky ducky that they are, is able to connect to the Irmansul directly on accident with just one whiff of the stuff. Tainari tells us that the original Dendro Archon had her consciousness directly linked to the Irman Soul while she was alive, and that it is her voice we heard saying the words, World Forget Me, through the Irman Soul. That implies that at least some of her residual consciousness is still somewhat aware of what's going on and may intentionally be reaching out to us for some reason, because, you know, we're magical, plot armored, deity, god, protagonist people. Yeah. But during the second Archon quest, Kusanali expresses concern that the Irmansul is slowly dying and that Greater Lord Ruka Devada's last message is the key to finding a way to heal it because if we don't, then all of Tivat will die along with it, which is great. Now, later on during the Aranara quest line, we learn that the phenomenon known as the Withering is the manifestation of the Irman Soul's affection, the one that Kusanali is trying to cure. We'll cover this infection a little bit later when we talk more about the Aranara. Just remember that the Withering and the Irman Soul are connected for now. Now, technically speaking, the only pieces of new information here are related to the Irmansul's infection and the greater Lord Rukatavada's connection to the tree itself. Everything else that I've laid out here has been pieced together from fragments of lore scattered in various places throughout the entire game, but I've marked this whole thing as new and important and put it at the very beginning of the video because it's been explicitly confirmed now. The Irmansul and the Ley Line's functions are actually very critical for understanding how the world of Tevat functions. Memories are literally the lifeblood of Tevat, and nowhere is this more apparently illustrated for us than in our next topic, the Akasha system. On a technical level, the Akasha system is actually pretty simple. It's basically a cloud server or a local intranet, with the Akasha terminals acting like a Bluetooth headset that you can control with your brain. It's kind of like being able to think, Okay, Akasha, what's the answer to my question? And then have Akasha dump the info directly into your brain after retrieving it from the cloud servers. It's kind of like going, okay, Google, okay, Siri, help me out here. That said, it's got a limited range and seems to work best in city. So mostly in, you know, Sumeru City and Port Ormos. That's basically all there is to it. But the sketchy part about this is that the Akasha appears to be somewhat sentient because it can decide to just not give you information. 
Unlike our modern search engines in real life like Google, we do still have some level of anonymity. I mean, it's not much, but we still have some. Whereas with the Akasha, you have none. Because of that, the Akasha knows basically everything there is to know about you, and it is able to therefore decide what you should and should not know and gives you new information based on that, which is creepy. Even sketchier is that the system can both grant knowledge and compile knowledge, not unlike certain search engines that we know, and it acquires that directly from your brain, which is different from things like Google. They are not quite in my brain yet. I, I hope. <clears throat> anyway, the, the main reason people in Sumeru think that they don't dream is because the Akasha system effectively harvests data from their dreams and compiles it into its personal databases, effectively erasing any memories of the dream itself. And if the idea of harvesting information or knowledge or data from dreams confuses you, my pseudo-scientific answer to this would be that it probably has something to do with the function of sleep when it comes to the brain. Because, like, technically, sleep isn't necessary for the body, it's only necessary for the brain. Your body is just fine, just resting. While the true purpose of dreaming is unconfirmed, scientists have long believed that dreams are one of the many methods by which your brain processes new information and then commits it to long-term memory by weaving fragments of memories and newly acquired information all together. This process is called memory consolidation, and I think that's what Genshin is trying to go for here with the Akasha's dream harvesting system thing. Perhaps it's able to parse through the thought fragments and then recompile them into its own databases. To me, that sounds like it's probably within its capabilities. Now, during the second part of the Archon Quest, the Sages of the Academia leverage the Akasha system's dream harvesting function to effectively force every person wearing a terminal into the exact same dream. In this case, one hosted by Nilu. Unaware that they were dreaming, everyone relived the same day over and over and over and over again. How many times? I don't know. I lost count. And this caused extreme mental fatigue. In the case of some people, like Dunyarzad, the mental fatigue was actually fatal. Yes, I know she's alive at the end of the quest, but Kusanali does claim that she died at one point, but as far as I can tell, this might have been like a brain death kind of thing. And Kusanali was later able to venture into the endless realm of the dream spaces to find whatever was left of Junior's art's mind and then recover it. Hence why she didn't actually die outside the dream. Yeah, it's kind of a cop-out if you want my opinion, but anyway. The most interesting thing about this dream loop is how the Traveler described the spaces outside the dream after they left the city. They said there were countless spaces filled with bizarre and fantastic things, and that these should have been the individual dream spaces of each person who had been sucked into Nilu's dream. I imagine that these spaces are reminiscent of, like, a lot of bubbles. Some are adjacent to each other, and some aren't. They're kind of connected, but also they're entirely separate. If this description sounds a little bit familiar to you, you either play Honkai and are thinking of bubble universes, or you might have watched this video of mine on domains where I talk about the exact same thing. That said, if you're new to the channel and you haven't watched it, please do. I feel like this whole bubble concept is going to become very important in light of recent events. Anyway, at the end of each dream loop, the Akasha terminal that the person is wearing beeps, and at that moment in time, all of the dreams in this endless dream space were consumed by a bright light that looked like the sun in the sky. In my opinion, that light has to have been the Akasha system. I'm not exactly certain how many dream loops passed, because I didn't bother counting, but it was a lot, and I'm not really sure that that matters apart from it just being a lot. As for the purpose of the controlled mass harvesting of dreams, well... I think Dia was probably right when she said that the sages might be trying to create a giant hive mind, or at least bolster the Akasha system with a massive influx of data. As for why they would want to do this, I think it might be because they need the data for a big project. In my opinion, the resurrection of Ruka Devada, or the creation of an artificial gnosis. In my opinion, an artificial gnosis's construction actually makes sense here, since the Akasha system needs a gnosis to operate, and gnosis just means knowledge. Well, in the case of Genshin, it means divine knowledge. Kind of like the divine knowledge capsule, huh? And considering the fact that the Academia has banned the use of knowledge capsules while continuing to use them for themselves for unknown purposes, and then they proceeded to lose this super special divine knowledge capsule in the desert, I think the idea of creating an artificial gnosis actually has some merit. But maybe we should look into the knowledge capsules a little bit more first. 
Knowledge capsules, also known as canned knowledge, are basically like USB flash drives for the Akasha terminals. This is noteworthy because the Akasha decides what people can and cannot learn, but knowledge capsules lack this function. Anyone who has the capsule can have that knowledge. It's uncensored, so to speak. It's obvious that a governing body that wants to control the flow of information wouldn't want that kind of thing to be easy to access, so it makes sense that the Sumeru Academia higher-ups would ban them. But it's not as simple as all that, at least not if Alhatham is to be believed. Now, during the Archon quest, he says that people who seek out these knowledge capsules are, quote, unsatisfied with the path chosen for them by the Akasha and wish to change their fate. Now, if the Akasha decides someone's fate by deciding what they should and shouldn't know, then that's huge because the other thing that decides a person's fate is their constellation, which is in the sky, which is like a god-level thing, and obviously the Akasha is powered by a god, so there's also that. Now, if you weren't around for the Unreconciled Stars event way back in 1.1, this video may interest you because it is actually relevant again! Because during that event, we learned that the sky is not only just a lie, but the stars aren't really stars at all. They're just rocks masquerading as stars that are scattered throughout the firmament. But these rocks that are pretending to be stars are suspiciously similar to these things we know as... Irminsul fruit, and if you remember earlier when I explained how Irminsul is this world tree that the, like, the heart of Tevat, then you might see where I'm going with all of this. If Irminsul sucks up memories in the same way normal trees suck up water and nutrients, then it's going to use those memories that it absorbs eventually to create a fruit. Those fruits, I've suggested, hang in the sky as stars and dictate the fates of those in Tevat. Now, before you tell me that the Irminsul is underground, yes, yes, I know that, but also remember that this is a magic tree whose branches and roots can be physically separate from the main trunk and still connected to each other, at least if the description of the ley line sprouts and branches are anything to go by. And there are places in-game that talk about this inverted tree in the sky. And so this is all definitely connected somehow, and one day I'll put this all together in another coherent video, but that day is not today. Anyway, knowledge capsules can easily be likened to Irminsul fruit as they are literally seeds of knowledge that are just chock full of memories, which, when used, can let the user literally change their fate by giving them entirely new skill sets and information that they can do something else with. It's kind of like wishing on a shooting star, only that star is a USB drive, you know? And since elemental energy and memories are stored in the Irman Soul, it makes sense that you can use elemental sight to determine the quality of the capsule's contents, which we did in the quest. A higher elemental energy concentration most likely means that there's a higher concentration of memories inside as well. Therefore, dense capsules are more likely of higher quality, which is why Alhatham suggests using this ability in the first place. So basically, to tie this back to the whole Gnosis idea, I kind of think that they're probably trying to, you know, like, consolidate whatever fragments of Rukadavada's, you know, memories that they have into one divine knowledge capsule, and that would make something that's kind of akin to a Gnosis. It's possible. It's a little bit of a stretch. I think they're going to try it. Because, you see, there's actually more evidence for this. See, it's worth pointing out that the divine knowledge capsule is red, but normal knowledge capsules are actually green. Green is usually a color that's associated with something being safe, and red is usually a color associated with something being not so safe. In this case, I'm going to say that green knowledge capsules are pretty standard, that's how they normally look, but when the red light comes on, that means there's something wrong with your data and it's probably a little corrupted, which is why when this dude, the captain of the Ain al Akmar, uh, used it, uh, he went a little bonkers, and the only way to stop him was to shut down his Akasha terminal because, you know, that kind of disrupts the flow of information, or at least I'm guessing at that part. However, that really wasn't my point here. My point was that this dude who used it, he's the captain of the Ain al Akmar, he did so by thinking he'd obtained the knowledge of their god, the Aramite god, the Scarlet King. But this capsule actually probably more likely contained some amount of Ruka Devada's knowledge instead because the words he uttered when he was starting to pass out were hers. She literally said, world, forget me, and that's what he said as he's kind of being dragged away. So, since this capsule is the one that the Academia supposedly lost in the desert and was trying to retrieve, I'm pretty convinced they're trying to bring her back, or they're trying to build her knowledge into an artificial gnosis. One of the two. One of the two. They're gonna do one of them. And that just about covers it for the Archon quest. We're gonna move on to the Aranara. It seems like a lot of people have had a really hard time following the Aranara questline, because 
uh, the R and R themselves overcomplicate the lore. It's it's not them. It's just the way that they're written and the way that they're presented. The things that the R&R actually tell us are very simple and surprisingly straightforward for this game. But the problem is that they give us this information out of order, out of context, and in kind of jumbled sentences with words that they never define, which makes things feel way more complex than they actually are. So to simplify things, I'm going to do something I don't usually do, and I'm going to present to you a timeline of Sumeru, and then we're going to go into more detail about each of the things that we cover once this context is in place. I feel like without the timeline, it's just going to be a lot of info dumping and no one's going to be able to digest it. So that's why we're doing this. Okay, here we go. Basically, thousands of years ago, before the Archon War, all of Sumeru was Veluka. That means sand or desert. Within this desert, there were three gods worth remembering for the sake of this video. They were the Scarlet King, the Goddess of Flowers, and Ruka Devada. These three gods were friends and each of them pursued wisdom in their own unique way. Everything was fine in the desert, and then all sorts of bad stuff happens, and the Goddess of Flower dies. And then the Scarlet King goes mad with grief because he was really into the Goddess of Flowers. The only thing that matters here is timing, because it's around this point in time, supposedly, that Ruka Devada tries to create an oasis within the desert. In other words, her early forest wasn't really a forest at all, because it was still full of sand. But that forest did become the rest of the forested region of Sumeru that we know today. In these early days, Ruka Devada, also known then as Queen Aranyani, to the Aranara anyway, so if you hear that name, that's who it is, it's Ruka Devada, she sang a very powerful magic song to the Irminsul, and that summoned a very special tree called the Ashvata tree. And from that tree, a pomegranate fell, which is weird because that tree is technically supposed to be a fig tree. But anyway, uh, that pomegranate produced the race of the Aranara from its seeds. It's technically more accurate to say that all of the Aranara are the seeds from the pomegranate, not just that they came from the seeds because they are seeds, but we'll get to that. Just hang on. Thousands of years after this event, the Cataclysm of Conria descended upon Zumeru and Ruka Devada returned to the Irminsul tree in order to, quote, heal the world, but she never returned and is presumed dead. Now, around this time, the abyssal monsters appeared, black rain fell from a black sky, and the dark mud covered the ground with, quote, toxic blood. All of these phenomena were caused by the abyss, which the Aranara call the Marana. And they say that the Marana is the memory of death that exists within the Irminsul, and is therefore the infection within the Irminsul. They say the Marana can turn the forest into sand and that it sucks life from everything it touches. For example, it creates withering zones. This Marana force is what destroyed the original home of the Aranara and forced them to relocate. Now, the exact timing of the next events are a little bit unclear, but sometime either during or slightly after the Cataclysm, the Traveler's sibling visits the Aranara but does not give their name. Now, we can pinpoint this time roughly due to the absence of Dainsliff as well as the presence of the Abyssal Corruption, aka the Marana. If that confuses you, I'll just remind you that Dainsliff and the Traveler's sibling traveled together for an extended period of time, but they split due to a difference of opinions during the Cataclysm after Dainsliff apparently betrayed everybody or something to that effect that we don't really know the details of. Since he wasn't there, but the Abyssal Corruption was, that implies that the Traveler's sibling was there after their uh, breakup, so to speak. That said, it's very unclear whether or not this event takes place before or after the encounter with the Sustainer of Heavenly Principles. Anywho, while with the Aranara, the Abyss Twin accomplishes quite a few feats. Most notably, though, they help the Aranara relocate to their new forest home, and then they fixed this thing called the Varuna Contraption in the Apam Woods. Now, the Varuna contraption helped to purify all of the waters and cleanse the land of all of the black rain and the mud and everything else. So, the Aranara called the Abyss Twin Nara Varuna, which is basically like calling them the human that fixed the Varuna, if I want to paraphrase and add a bunch of words in there. So, anytime you hear the name Nara Varuna or the Golden Nara, that's probably referring to the Traveler's sibling. Okay, so that's the gist of the timeline that we got from the Aranara. Now we can get into the details of each of the individual aspects of the events that happened in this timeline that we just laid out. Let's start with the Marana and the Withering. As I mentioned earlier, the Withering is one of the forms that Marana, or the Abyss, takes. It's been present in the nation of Sumeru for millennia, 
But if the Aranara are remembering things correctly, Marana wasn't actually present in any of the forested areas until the cataclysm happened 500 years ago. The Aranara claim that Marana is supposed to be one with the creatures of the abyss, and it's also been called the memory of death as well as the cause of the Irmansul sickness. So long as the memory of Marana exists within Irmansul, it cannot be defeated and Irmansul will eventually die, and Tevat will die along with it. Interestingly, it's all connected to the black corrosive rain, the black skies, dark mud, like the stuff in the chasm, and the rift hounds, which means that its reach is definitely not limited to Sumeru. In fact, Durin could have been an avatar of Marana, and so could the miasmic tumor in the roots of the sacred Sakura and Inazuma, since allowing that to go unchecked can cause the sea to turn black and the land to fill with monsters. As far as relevancy goes, I'm not quite sure how important the Aranara will be going forward, but I think a lot of their aspects will be important. So let me just explain a little bit about who the Aranara are, how they function, and what some really interesting details of them are. As you probably know by now, the Aranara used to be visible to everyone, as they were originally created to be friends with the humans, and it was only after the Cataclysm 500 years ago that adults stopped dreaming and they lost their ability to see the Aranara. The Aranara are curious little life forms. They're sentient seeds that eventually turn into trees once they have accumulated enough memories. Now remember what I said earlier about Irminsul being the source of all memories, a giant tree that's just made of them? Well, if the Ashvata tree that the Aranara are born from came directly from Irminsul, then these little sentient seeds are kind of like walking knowledge capsules with sentience. Because, like, they say some pretty sus things. Not only do they have to accumulate a massive amount of memories in order to grow into a giant magic tree, which is their whole life's purpose, they can also cast magic that consumes their own memories. They will literally forget things after they use their magic. Plus, they are even caught saying, death is just a one-time loss of memories. So I can't really tell if they're legitimately immortal and never die, or if they just forget everything and therefore become a whole new person because you're defined by your memories. And since, like, Araja is like, yeah, I'm old as hell, but those memories don't belong to me, so that really wasn't me. But yes, I've been told that it was me, at least in the past, and they're literally, like, walking sentient memory seed things. It's so strange. I can't tell how many of their memories are like individual to them and how many of them are like from Irminsul itself. Like were they seeds that came from Irminsul? Like they were formed around one specific core memory that came from Irminsul and now they're just like adding all of these other memories on it like a big snowball or like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just don't know. But it's really interesting to think about given that the whole function of Tevat is based on memories, right? But while we're on the topic of the really suspicious things that the RNRs say, Arama tells us that there are those who no longer dream and thus can no longer see us, and those who have accepted fate and have stopped searching for the way forward. Now, the accepted fate line is weirdly in line with the line that Alhatham says in relation to the knowledge capsules. Remember this, the whole unsatisfied with the path chosen for them by the Akasha and then the wish to change their fate line? Yeah, that one. There's a whole ass theory in there somewhere that I'll try to articulate at some point, just not right now. But in speaking of stars and fates and the Akasha and trees and all this kind of stuff, we're, we're thinking about trees and celestial bodies in kind of the same framework, right? And then we have the Aranara over here that keep likening the Traveler and their sibling to the sun. And it, they do it way too many times for it not to mean anything. I don't know what it means yet, but I want to point out that they also liken Paimon to the moon. And yeah, okay, maybe that's not like super suspicious at first blush because you can compare anything to the sun and anything to the moon if it's gold or silver, right? But at the same time, the Aranara never call Paimon Anara. Never. They call every other human Anara, but not Paimon. They only call her Paimon or White Floaty. Again, this might not seem weird, but you have to remember that the Aranara even recognize Hillichurls as Nara. They call them Hilinaras. This means that the Aranara don't see Paimon as anything even remotely human, which is wild because she looks just about as human as any Hillichurl does, right? 
But that just means that the Aranara recognize whatever race Paimon is, whether consciously or not. So that brings me to my next topic. Namely, the Seelies and the Moon Sisters. Up until this point, there's been like no actual solid confirmation that the three moons in the sky were a real thing, or that the Moon Sisters were a real thing, or that Seelies were actually a race at some point. It's always legend has it, or the stories go that, or at one point in time, or once upon a time, or whatever. It is all conjecture. No one knew if this was like anecdotal or real history. It's looking like it's real history. If you haven't heard about the Moon Sisters or the Seelie race before, well, here's the TLDR. Basically, at one point in ancient history, like pre-Archon War history, Tavat had three moon sisters who were like deities and supposedly were like a singular moon each, right? The moon sisters governed over not only humans, but a race of life forms known as the Seelies. The Seelies were basically tasked with teaching and guiding humans, often traveling with them. But they were specifically born with a curse to never fall in love with a human, which is a really weird curse to have with like no context whatsoever. Also, who is cursing them? I, I have to know this. Is it the same person who cursed Danes of like, who is doing this? Oh, sorry, what was I saying? Oh, right. Well, it's not a 100% confirmed fact yet, there is a legend in the game about a Seelie who fell in love with a traveler from afar, supposedly a human. Three days after their marriage in the Lunar Palace, a great calamity befell the world, and it resulted in the death of two of the Moon Sisters, while one of them remained in the sky, either as a corpse or as someone locked away in her palace in her grief. There's like four versions of this legend, and they differ a little bit. Anyway, in their grief, the Seelies kind of wasted away and turned into ghosties. Arama specifically says the Seelies were a beautiful race and that they traveled with humans in order to teach them. These little ghosties that we follow to their stone pedestals are just the ghostly husks that they left behind. Arama goes on to say that one Seelie who survived was actually friends with both the Scarlet King and Ruka Devada, which would most likely make her out to be the goddess of flowers. That is an idea that I want to explore later, but probably more so once the desert region comes out. But more importantly, I am now convinced that Paimon is just a straight up Seelie. Not a moon sister, not the god of time, but a surviving Seelie. I will make a proper video on this as well at some point, but we know that Paimon A loves to sing and Seelies are associated with singing and having a source song and all that other kind of stuff. And she's actively traveling and trying to teach a human just like the Seelies are supposed to. And before anyone says that she hasn't taught the traveler anything, I want to point out that she did teach the traveler how to read and speak the common language of Tevat. So I think regardless of what you think about her, like as a gameplay teaching experience, I think she is actually teaching the Traveler things in game, like canonically. But anyway, there's also this one Fatui dude that just straight up calls her a floating Seelie. And we know that Seelies are guided to their Seelie courts, which are also kind of like fairy courts in mythology. And Paimon is often called a pixie or a fairy by everyone else. So my conclusion is that Paimon's just a Seelie. That's basically what I got from all this. Paimon is just a surviving Seelie child that fell into the ocean and somehow stayed down there for who knows how long until the Traveler fished her out. That's my conclusion. Okay, that basically concludes all my big highlights, so now it's time for the Rapid Fire Roundup, which is basically just a bunch of much shorter topics that I think are still important, but probably aren't that confusing to people and therefore don't need much context or explanation. Like Visions, because we finally got confirmation that Visions manifest with their cases on, but that just raises more questions like, why is Kaya's case so funky, and how does Amber attach stuff to hers if, you know, Visions are impervious to damage, at least according to Kaching and Sucrose? And how do people attach their Visions to their outfit? Are they sticky? Do they have magic Velcro? I have so many more questions and no answers, which is why it's here. I'm just mentioning it. Visions manifest with their cases. It's important. I honestly probably should have talked about Kusanali a little bit more during the Akasha Terminal section, but I needed some context about the Goddess of Flowers first. So here's a mini theory, I guess. Kusanali probably doesn't look anything like Ruka Devada, even though I kind of think she's a clone, just not a clone of Ruka Devada. I don't think that anymore. I say this because Kusanali calls herself the first Akasha Terminal, and judging by the relationship between Ruka Devada and the Goddess of Flowers, she might actually be based off of the Goddess of Flowers instead. 
Especially if they're going to reference the Kusanali Jakata because the Kusa sprite and the tree sprite aren't actually directly related in there. And Ruka Devada would be the tree sprite, right? Ruka Devada really loved the Goddess of Flowers, so it would make sense to create something to honor her memory. And the Goddess of Flowers was kind of more of a water spirit, like water kind of poured from her sleeves or like that's kind of how she's described. She's described as like the oasis in the desert, so to speak, right? And the thing is, in Persia, one of the most important deities was the water goddess, Anahita, or Anahida. And we've got Kusanali here, whose name is Nahida, which is one letter off of Anahida. So I'm kind of thinking she references the goddess of flowers more than Ruka Devada. That's my speculation, that's why it's not in the Akasha section. That said, here is something also related to the Akasha, Catherine. Well, uh, okay, Catherine's not directly related, but this idea about Catherine is. We finally got confirmation that Catherine is indeed a robot, because Kusanali calls her a bionic puppet from Shnesnaya. The part that connects it to the Akasha is that apparently Kusanali likes to possess Catherine on a regular basis to just kind of run around town. This isn't really disturbing on its own, but when you think about it, uh, Catherine might be a robot, but Kusanali says that she can literally possess any creature that is wearing an Akasha terminal, including humans. But Kusanali also claims that she has always respected her people's free will, and that's why she's never possessed any of them, but that does imply that she can just take over anyone's body and force them to do whatever she wants, so long as they're wearing an Akasha terminal, so that's... That's a thing. Let's talk about Elazar. Basically, this disease is pretty rare, and it's a condition that causes the skin to harden into something like tough scales, and over time, it causes numbness in the limbs, and eventually, it causes total paralysis. Both Dunyarzad and Kolei have this disease. Dunyarzad's condition is a bit more severe than Kolei's, though, because Kolei was in the care of the Fatui for a long time, undergoing some really dreadful human experimentation that left a malicious snake god sealed inside her, supposedly. Uh, and for some reason, while within the Fatui's care, her condition never really got worse. I'm wondering if there's a connection between Dottori's experiments of uh, injecting Kole with Archon Residue, aka Dead God Juice, and the manifestation of Elazar, or the management of it. I'm, I'm not quite sure where to go with that yet, but I want to point out that there's something there, I just don't know what it is yet. It's worth mentioning. As a closing note, I wanted to touch on Tignari's name, even though it's not technically part of the lore roundup. You probably noticed that in almost every language, it's not pronounced Tignari, but some variation of Tainari or Tinari. If you're wondering which version is technically correct, well, the short answer is Tignari, but with an Arabic sound that I cannot make. The long answer is, it's complicated. After a whole lot of digging and a couple of surprise interviews, I learned that Tignari's name most likely came from the diverse multicultural kingdom of Al-Andalus, located in the Iberian Peninsula as early as 700 AD. As you may well imagine, the linguistics get a little messy here due to all the close cultural exchanges, both for good and for ill. But essentially, depending on what dialect you are referencing, the pronunciation of Tignari can vary quite a bit. But the same can be said for both Dia and Candice, whose names are more widely pronounced as Dahaya and Kandake, respectively. That said, I am by no means an expert on pre-modern linguistics, so this is quite literally all the credible information that I can provide. I just think it's important to remember that language is fluid. It evolves over time, and there can be multiple correct ways to pronounce words, and we should be cognizant of that as we move forward and definitely willing to adjust our ways of thinking. But that's also just my opinion. I'll be calling him Tignari solely because of the fact that he takes a lot of inspiration from the botanist Al Tignari, and sometimes I'll call him Twiggy because it's cute and it's kind of a pun. And that concludes the 3.0 lore roundup. We covered a lot of ground, and this wasn't even everything that we learned this patch. I excluded a lot of information in an effort to keep things a little bit more digestible. But never fear, we will be covering a good deal of all of the skipped content in later videos, so stay tuned for that. I just want to say thank you all so much for watching and a very special thanks to the members for supporting this channel and helping these videos get made faster. I know there's been a bit of a gap lately, but we'll be on a roll again very soon. I hope you're all having a blast this patch and that your summons are blessed with focus units. Take care, everybody. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.